two men. Two philosophies. Two choices. One decision. You decide. Hello, my name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years, and now I live here in Pensacola, Florida, and it's a great privilege of mine to be able to defend the Bible against those who believe in the theory of evolution. What you're about to see is one of my debates that I do at various universities on this subject of creation and evolution. I am, without apology, a young earth Bible-believing creation scientist. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate, and you will see in this debate, uh, the opposing side, the evolution view, which is currently being taught in our school system, of course, at taxpayers' expense. And I'll be sharing what the Bible teaches in the creation view, how God made the world. Now, if the Bible is correct, and we are created by God, and God is the owner of this world, then we will stand before him someday, and he will be our judge. You need to be prepared for that day. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, be sure to get a hold of me. I'd be glad to share with you what the Bible says about how to be forgiven, how to be saved, and go to heaven. February 9, 1969, I asked the Lord to be my savior became a member of God's family, and I'd be honored to show you how to do the same. We hope you enjoyed the debate. If this is all you have, you ought to get a list of our other materials. You can contact our office in Pensacola, Florida by email, drdino.com, just drdino.com, or you can call us at 850-479-3466. Thank you. It's good to be here. I taught uh, high school science 15 years. Uh, in Christian schools. I have a PhD in education, not in science, and it's from a non-accredited small Christian school. Uh, academic uh, requires, sometimes people use, uh, people say you're not qualified to talk about a certain subject, and then they will use the ad hominem argument of you cannot discuss this because you've not been trained. Well, Columbus had no training, and yet he proved the world was round. Uh, a lot of people down through history have proven science to be wrong on things. I'm of the strong opinion that uh, modern science has a long history, and I, and I love science, don't misunderstand this, but science has a long history of being wrong, seriously wrong, on important issues. For years they taught if you were sick, it's because you had bad blood, and they drained your blood out or drained some blood out to help you get well. That's how George Washington was killed. For years they taught that heavy objects fall faster than lighter objects. As a matter of fact, that was taught for 2,000 years until Galileo proved uh, that was wrong by dropping off the cannonball and the BB from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And today, science is wrong on, I think, two rather important issues. Number one, they are wrong about the age of the earth. Really, the issue of creation and evolution can be settled pretty quickly uh, if you can prove the earth is young. And uh, the, the modern philosophy, and I, I prefer to call it a religion, the modern religion of evolution is based on the assumption that the world is billions of years old. If the world is not, if the universe is not billions of years old, then the argument's over. Uh, it had to be created. And I have uh, quite a collection of scientific evidences that the earth is young uh, in the neighborhood of six or 7,000 years. Now that happens to coincide with the Bible, and I do believe the Bible uh, from cover to cover, but that doesn't hinder or limit my scientific investigation. I can come at this with my eyes wide open. I am not prejudiced. Uh, I am willing to look at any evidence. And I have a long time standing offer of $10,000 for anyone who can offer any scientific evidence for evolution. Evolution is simply a pagan religion that is being promoted as fact in the school system today, and I resent my tax dollars going to pay for that. I believe kids ought to be told the truth. And the truth is, there is a lot of evidence the earth is young. Let me just give you a few of them, and I have hundreds. The sun is shrinking five feet every hour on the average right now. If it were millions of years old, only 20 million years ago, the sun would have been so large it would touch the earth's orbit. It cannot be billions of years old because of the shrinking sun. The moon is receding, slowly getting further away from us. Less than a million years ago, the moon would have been close enough to cause tides that would drown everybody on earth twice a day. That's less than one million years ago. Less than two or three million years ago, it would have been inside Rocha's limit. It could not orbit. The moon and earth system cannot be more than a few million years old, period. Evolutionists will uh, categorically ignore any evidence that teaches the earth is young because they so desperately need millions or billions of years to make their theory look reasonable. 
Uh, there is a lot of evidence, and I have plenty of stuff. The dust layer on the moon, it was predicted to be 182 feet thick because they knew it got about an inch thick every 10,000 years. And yet when they landed on it, uh, it was only three-fourths of an inch thick, indicating six or 7,000 years of dust accumulation. Here on Earth, uh, just from, biolog from biology, which I taught biology, earth science, and uh, physical science for 15 years, there are many uh, examples from biology. The genetic load that we carry that's slowly been accumulating, getting worse and worse, uh, could not have gone on for billions of years. The population of the Earth right now is only 5 million. Based on current population growth, it would have gone from near zero to 5 billion in less than a few thousand years, which again happens to correspond uh, exactly with what the Bible teaches, that the population started 4,400 years ago with a worldwide flood. But I have uh, plenty of evidence that the Earth is young, and every time you try to mention anything about the Earth being young, the, the spin of the Earth, for instance, is slowing down. We have to add a thousandth of a second every day because of the slowing spin rate of the Earth. That would mean less than a million years ago, it would be going so fast that it would be like Jupiter, causing constant hurricanes on the surface of the Earth. And these are things that man can do nothing about. We cannot control the spin of the Earth or the receding moon or the shrinking sun or Jupiter is losing heat and Jupiter's moon Io is extremely volcanic and yet it's extremely small. It should have lost all of its heat and been ice cold millions of years ago. But uh, any evidence that the solar system is young is categorically rejected by those who believe in evolution. And I'm of the firm opinion that people choose evolution uh, because of their training. There are some sincere, honest people who believe it because that's all they've been taught. But there are some who believe it because it's uh, politically expedient to go along with the mainstream. Uh, you would definitely lose a job in a university like this if you were to go against the mainstream teaching of evolution and uh, espouse uh, creation, or if a geologist here became convinced the earth was young and began teaching that, or at any major university, he would be in jeopardy of losing his job. Another thing uh, I'd like to point out, the earth is not millions of years old. Carbon-14 dating and uh, those kind of things would be a little technical for this audience, we won't get into that, but uh, Willard Libby that invented carbon dating uh, said it's only accurate for two to three thousand years. And he said it should be in equilibrium in less than, than 30,000 years in the atmosphere, and it's still not in equilibrium right now. It's only one-third of the way to equilibrium. Therefore, the atmosphere has to be less than 10,000 years old. But this kind of information, it's called an anomaly. And you'll hear uh, people who believe in evolution talk about things. Well, that's just an anomaly. We don't have a way to explain that. But that doesn't mean we need to throw out the theory. Well, I say, yes, we do need to throw out the theory. Uh, evolution has been uh, falsified in, in the minds of many. Ninety-some percent of the population of the United States does not believe in evolution. And yet, all of us have to pay for it to be taught. How much time do I have? Excuse me, I'd like to have that statistic again. Uh, Gallup poll, 1981, uh, I forget where it's published, I've got it in my file, uh, that 94% thought creation and evolution should be taught uh, in the school system. And uh, those who believed in a God or that God created, I believe it was 90%, the Gallup poll said from a, from a survey. You t It'll be like, I'm, I'm taking up my time here, yeah, okay. But I'll, I'll stop your time. Okay. I want to get these facts correct so I can challenge you. Oh, okay. If they're not correct. Sure. Because you changed. You first said 94% said they believed in... No, 94% said both ought to be taught in the school system, creation and evolution. Okay. All right. And it was near 90% that said they believed in creation. Now, whether it was... believed in a God creating the world, whether it was millions of years ago or recently, okay. that, that was split, but... Okay? Okay. Okay. Then I think modern science is... Six minutes. Five. Six minutes. Modern science is very wrong today about geology, which uh, the, my friend here teaches at this university. Most of modern geology is based on the geologic column. And very few people realize that the geologic column, as it's presented, the 12 different layers, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic era, does not exist any place in the world except in the textbook. That's the only place it can be found in that order. Geologic column is a hoax developed by Charles Lyell in 1830 and others. It's been a great influential tool in the world in, de in developing our modern thinking, and that is uh, supposedly the crowning accomplishment of geology, the fact that th they think they have proved the Earth is millions of years old. I have many pictures, some on the table here, of what, what are called polystrata fossils, petrified trees like I have on the board, on the chalkboard. Many times trees are found running through many layers of strata. I have a picture of a 47-foot tall tree running through 40 or 50 million years worth of strata by evolutionist thinking. And yet the tree is standing up, vertical position, petrified. Uh, the simple fact is a worldwide flood, as mentioned in the Bible, would have caused all of the layers of strata in less than a year. Just the earth turning under the moon, the tides would cause two or three or four or five layers every day to be deposited. Mount St. Helens proved that when it erupted in 1980. It blew 600 feet of mud down into the Toodle River and uh, blocked off the Toodle River. 
The mud dam lasted five days until the river breached over the top and carved out a miniature Grand Canyon in about 30 minutes. The miniature Grand Canyon that it carved out, and I've got plenty of pictures of that, uh, was when they went down into it, they noticed it was all stratified just like Grand Canyon is, all layers of strata. Well, moving water, moving mud automatically sorts particles by density, uh, hydrologic sorting that's called. And so the worldwide flood mentioned in the Bible caused all of the layers of strata that we see and all of the erosion was caused very quickly, or most of the erosion was caused, the Badlands and Grand Canyon, etc., was caused in the first day or so as the floodwaters receded, which is plainly taught in Psalms 104 and Genesis chapter 8. So I believe that the geologic sciences, and I taught earth science for 13 out of my 15 years, the geologic column is absolutely a hoax and a fraud. All of the dating of the geologic column is based on the types of fossils that they find. And yet they date the fossils by the layer that they're found in. It's absolutely circular reasoning. Uh, the fossil, they have index fossils for each layer, and then the fossils are dated by the layer, and the layer is dated by the fossils. I could prove that and document that over and over. That's uh, a classic case of circular reasoning. The geologist looks to the biologist to prove evolution, and the biologist looks back to the geologist and hopes he has proved it. Actually, neither one has proved it. It's simply a, a hoax and a lie, and it's a 20th century myth. Evolution uh, is not science at all and has no business being taught in the science textbook. So as far as geology, uh, the, the thing that concerns me most, I guess, is the effects that evolution has on our society. This doctrine of evolution, the, the idea that man is the ultimate, we are the God of the universe, has brought us people like Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Karl Marx and Paul Pott and I could, a host of others that have wreaked havoc on our society because, directly because of their evolutionary thinking. They think man is just an animal and that only the strongest survive and you have to be the most ruthless to make it ahead. And it has, it has brought terrible heartache and suffering to this world and I am of the strong opinion and have dedicated my life to getting evolution out of the public schools. If a person believes evolution is true and they have a certain, certainly they have a right to believe that, but they need to go to start a private school and charge tuition and pay to have people pay to learn that. It is not right to make all of the public pay to have that religion of evolution taught in the public schools. It should be classified as a religion and it should be removed. Any reference of millions of years ago should be removed from the textbooks and should be removed from any state or any tax supported institution. If they're not going to teach all religions, then they should not be allowed to teach that religion. So uh, that's how much time do I have, brother? Um, you have two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Uh, Maximum. You don't have to take it. Oh, I will. I believe I got lots more to say here. Evolution has many faulty assumptions. Number one, they, they assume the world is billions of years old, and it is not. It cannot be billions of years old. Everything is running down. It's, evolution is also based on the assumption that you can get order from chaos. They completely overlook or ignore the question of where did the matter come from? Where did the laws come from? Where did the order come from? Uh, uh, questions like that. They are based on the assumption that we have increasing complexity, that you can go from simple forms to more complex forms. That has never been observed. There is no evidence of any in the fossil record of any animal changing to any other kind of animal. No evidence today and no evidence in the fossil record at all. They uh, are based on the assumption in biological evolution that there are beneficial mutations and yet no one has ever observed one beneficial mutation. There aren't any. Uh, evolution is based on the assumption that similarity proves a common ancestry. Because apes and humans are similar, they conclude we must be, have a common ancestor. I would say similarity proves a common creator just like the Honda Civic and the Honda Accord have some similarities, well that proves they're both made by the same company. It doesn't prove they both evolved from a Chevy. Uh, it's, the argument can go either way. So similarity does not necessarily prove common ancestry. And uh, lastly, uh, the tragic thing is that uh, a large number of scientists today believe that science is the only reality. If it cannot be proven scientifically, it cannot be real. Well, I would submit that we do not, today, we do not know what gravity is. We know what it does, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what light is, and we don't know what magnetism is. And yet we use all three of those all the time. And they, are, they are definitely real, even though we do not understand them. And I say God is just as real, and He did create this world about six or 7,000 years ago. You stated evolution is a doctrine, and I guess you believe that rather than a uh, science. It's a doctrine rather than a science. A, so I just want to make sure we're yes, sir. stating a, your position properly. A faith or a religion, right, not a science. And it should be thrown out of the public schools, but then your statistics said that both should be taught. That was the Gallup poll said people thought since one is taught, both should be taught equally. 
It's not fair to have which only you, one. Which do you prefer, it be totally thrown out or both be taught? I prefer that neither be taught because I think if we forced creation in, then those who believe in evolution that were forced to teach it would only ridicule it, and those who believe in creation, if they were forced to teach evolution, would only ridicule it. So the subject is, is not part of the public school curriculum, should not be. Just make sure to state the record. I'm, okay. I'm dying in here because um, part of building an audience is controversy. So I. But, um, but I at least want to um, I at least want to state that some of these statements. Um, we'll make sure we had your thinking. Sure. And uh, evolution is a pagan religion. Is that your your belief? Absolutely, yes, sir. It's for thousands of years. That's been a. When did and when did in your estimation when did evolution begin? I mean, when did this when did this teaching of evolution begin? Uh, in the Garden of Eden, when Satan said to Eve she, should, she would be a god if she followed his instructions, the idea that man is progressing to godhood is, originates in the mind of Satan, and it's been here since then. I'm surprised you had, didn't introduce me as Mephistopheles. <laughs> <laughs> or Hitler, right? Uh, well, I don't have a mustache, and my German is rather rusty. Just came back from there, yeah. so I... <laughs> uh, tell you what. Um, my approach, obviously, uh, is counter to that of my colleague at the other end of the table. Indeed, I do believe that the, uh, can you all hear me? Uh, I lecture in here usually without a microphone, so I may be talking too loud for some of you up front. I hope not. Uh, but we do have some devices for electronic uh, equipment as well, so I have to speak to two things simultaneously. Um, fundamentally, my position will be that the age of the Earth uh, is unquestionably in the order of 4.6, and probably in another 50 years we'll think 4.7 billion years old, uh, the universe being probably four times older than that. Uh, and that is not to protect the evolutionary theory, that's merely the cumulative converging evidence that leads us to that number. That's neither for or against anything that might be in your Judeo-Christian literature or in that of Buddhism, Taoism, Jainism, or the other religions of the world. In short, science is not just for North American uh, Western society or for this Earth. I think we've pretty well proved it by placing people on the moon and negotiating the outer periphery of our solar system, which a device, however wrong scientists may be about gravity, managed to negotiate the gravitational pull of every body in its way, and it's still reporting back. I think um, the question raised on the radio program about there being no evidence of evolution, I'm not going to take up the financial challenge uh, because basically there is, I'm sure, an unwritten caveat in that challenge that, that I will accept in terms of the evidence. Um, but um, fundamentally, we have evolution going on now, and I'll address later some uh, specific examples of it that we are taking advantage of every day uh, that's measurable today, visible today. Uh, you only have to read the newspaper or National Geographic or any um, uh, magazine and you'll find such evidence. Uh, with that said, essentially where I'm coming from, long time and the evolutionary uh, processes can be proven. And by the way, as a geologist, I don't focus as much as biologists do on animal and plant evolution. I'm talking about evolution of the universe, of this earth, our particular uh, planet and crust that we're familiar with, the process that's going on right now. What I'd like to focus on, and particularly because there are a number of young people here, and I want to keep things at a level where they can understand it, I've limited my visual aids to something fairly complex, A and B, and two spheres. I'm actually copying Albert Einstein, but uh, 
he is dead and doesn't hold the rights anymore to this so I can use it. In A, we're looking at a circle of light, which he described as representing knowledge. And the darkness here, that awful educated green of a blackboard, pretend that that is the blackness of ignorance, of no knowledge, the unknown. B is when, a time later, there is more knowledge. And what Einstein said in effect, and I'm not going to try and quote him exactly, was that as the diameter of a circle of light, meaning knowledge, increases, so too does the circumference of darkness around it. This is a fairly subtle way of saying for every question we answer, two more arise. And so as our knowledge becomes greater, however it's contributed, I'm not saying the scientific knowledge, it's the knowledge of Homo sapiens. As that knowledge becomes greater, so there will be much more that we will not understand and we'll have questions about. It is the, the very food of the scientist that there are questions to be asked. And for you young people, if you are not convinced that to do so would be to follow the devil's path, you can rest assured that there will be questions for you to try and solve and answers to be found and things to be learned regardless of how much the present generation does indeed work. Historically, in the black area of ignorance, we have ascribed to myth and to religion and to God as the causative elements for things we don't understand. In fact, today, if you read your insurance policy, you'll see it says, not accountable for acts of God. Now that's a nice phrase, but it means it's something that homo sapiens and technology cannot as yet explain. Now, the good pastor and I and Dr. Hovind, how, how are we doing time? Five, plenty of time, are well aware that all of you live in a high-tech world in which the fruits of science are things that you count on and depend upon every day to get here and to perhaps even have heard us yesterday. And one cannot be unaware of the fact that through scientific inquiry, we challenge and improve, and in doing so, we come closer to the truth. We make all kinds of mistakes. That is exactly the scientific process. When you think you have some hypothesis of value and you have some evidence to support it, you publish, not as final truth. Unfortunately, the media have not learned that. And they will publish anything that some young PhD puts out as fact. When in fact that is put out there for the rest of the world, be they scientists or not, to criticize, to try and test and retest and repeat and to fine tune and criticize. And slowly but surely, we eliminate the false and come closer to the truth. We now have pi out to several hundred decimal points. Someone is working on getting it out to thousands and millions. Because our technology enables us to read more carefully with more sensitive instruments, we can always improve. It is not to say that we have established the ultimate truth. It is merely the direction we're headed. And as such, we try to expand that circle of light, not to disprove anyone or anything, nor to prove anything, but to increase our understanding. And the test of that is the efficacy of that knowledge, that is, the utilitarian, the effectiveness, the way it can be applied. And I point to all the things that we do that show, indeed, that science has not been wrong. Indeed, scientists, young practitioners and old practitioners have published things that have been corrected. That self-correcting process is the lifeblood of research and investigation, of necessary inquiry. Any of you have learned from talking to your members of your family, friends, or colleagues 
to get another perspective and perhaps change the course of action through that interaction. And that's the whole idea of the scientific community's publications. To grab specific statements in a point in time by someone is to take merely that which fits when you're trying to prove something. Science is not trying to, nor is it able, to prove or disprove the presence of God. It merely is dealing with the way the universe works. And I'm not then saying that God is ignorance, but if one looks at the world and the way we operate and the history of Homo sapiens, the species has attributed to God things it didn't understand, and once it understands it, it seems less miraculous. And that's a sad thing, but it's human nature. In that sense, then, there is a hostility toward science which wrests things away from the unknown. Consider meteorology a hundred years ago, very crude, and nobody believed it. Today, we are getting much more sophisticated, and the weatherman is wrong. But it does not mean that he's not right 95% of the time, even to the point where they have been sued, the National Weather Service has been sued because they didn't predict a particular weather event that cost the man to lose his ship. Predicting earthquakes, predicting volcanoes, predicting floods are all things that we are on the brink of better and better prediction, the efficacy of scientific investigation. It is not perfect yet. And it never will be. But as that circle of light increases, we do get better, but we have more questions. So to say that geology has mistakes, what science has, that's only to say the sun rises in the east, when in effect our earth is rotating and the sun is relatively motionless as we do. And that should be sufficient for us. Intro. I'd like to make a couple questions back. It seems like a contradiction of terms, and maybe I misunderstood. But you said for every question we answer, there are two more questions. That appear. That appear. Much like when we magnify to see something clearer, we now see additional things we didn't see before. And that's what the electron microscope or anything has done, the telescope shows us what we looked at, and then we see things we hadn't seen, so. Then at the same time, we challenge and evaluate and come closer to the truth. Are we coming closer right. to the truth with more questions? Only within that sphere of light. In other words, we have the infinite darkness, which is all questions that we're not even aware of. And one other as a mathematician. Um, a mathematician? Well, I'll no, oh, say that. Oh, okay. No, no, don't quote me on that one. It's all right. I was a math major. In, uh, That's all right. When you talk about how they're expanding pi out to many decimal places, uh, will they ever come to the end? I don't believe so, but I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> so. uh, if you want to know, I use 3.1416 and never go any further, and it's sufficient for me. But if I were plotting the path of an orbiting device, uh, say, you know, three or four years out in space, I'd better have that carried out to many more decimal points. And then uh, I, there's several questions here, and I'm not, uh, and I'd like to let you have a little bit more time to, because there's several questions about the age of the Earth and uh, versus young versus old. Can you give just a, you gave a, a couple things. Would you give a couple things more or a couple things to talk? You, I remember you said something about the sun is shrinking, the moon is receding. That's the two I wrote down. But give a couple reasons why you believe that the earth is young and then you give a couple reasons why you believe the earth is old. And just, I mean. Okay, uh, meteors, the fact that we still have meteors in space, I should be on this mic here. Sorry. Okay, um, yet uh, comets or meteors only last 10 to 15,000 years before they're blown apart by the solar wind, yet we still have hundreds or possibly thousands of comets and meteors floating through space indicating either they are constantly being formed someplace or the universe is indeed less than 10 or 15,000 years old because that's about all the longer they can last. Uh, the earth is slowing down. The spin rate is slowing down. Uh, the erosion rate of the continents, at the current erosion rate, the continents would erode flat in 14 million years. 
which means they have eroded flat five times since the dinosaurs died out by evolutionary thinking, uh, at the, just at the current erosion rate. And I know the current theory is the mountain up, uplifting and floor, sea floor spreading, and I'm familiar with all of that. But that's just an indication that uh, that's a time, a limiting factor. Um, you want things from, is that like what you're looking for? Yeah, okay. That's fine. Well, the age of the Earth in absolute time uh, is based on various means of radiometric dating. Uh, carbon-14 was mentioned earlier, which, like a thermometer for, uh, say, oral thermometer, which covers a rather narrow range of temperature, carbon-14 was never used or intended by anyone to go back as far as my colleague indicated. It is purely like a limited thermometer. It's a recent one. Uh, lead uranium and others, but all of these Indeed, I can show you books and books. You are kind, actually, to talk about the few mistakes that were made by geologists and other scientists. They've been, that's, I guess, one of the things you learn from being one, is how many other mistakes have been made. Um, history of being wrong, um, including, I might add, the United States scientists were the ones who most steadfastly held against seafloor spreading and continental drift. Our geophysicist insisted it was not possible for that to happen. And kicking and screaming, our colleagues around the rest of the world worked it out. Finally, two Americans came up with a theory. But um, it was back to the drawing board, along with the engineer who said the bumblebee doesn't fly. The bee, independent of this, flies nicely. Uh, some of the problems with the examples given about time, the universe is indeed winding down and spreading out. But to use as a mathematician, or we'll say erstwhile mathematician, Thank you. Um, you appreciate the difference between a linear and a geometric relationship. And that is one of the problems that no one has decided which application would be more appropriate when we try and crank things back. We know they're going out, so should they come back at a linear rate, an accelerating rate? We don't have any criteria against which to judge this. The same problem with the Big Bang Theory. Things are going out. You know, as, you, as things spread out, that's in accord. However, the problem is we don't know, and this is beyond our scope. There are things within our scope, and fossils. Fossils are accidents. I lecture on that, and I'm not thrown out of the university, but fossils should not occur, simply because this system is beautifully designed to recycle all the components. We have hosts of organisms that cause decay and recycling within the system and cycles of all the atoms and elements. And it is only the exceedingly stupid or those caught in accidents that get preserved as fossils. And that goes for the men who fell in crevasses and the mammoths. Unfortunately, then, our judgments are based on remnants of probably the ones that are being selected out rather than the average. And gaps in the rock record, to be sure, you're quite correct. Nowhere does that column exist because we have, on one hand, erosion taking place above sea level and deposition taking place below sea level or water level. And it is only through a composite of here and here and here, and that is listed as a generalized composite. But the cumulative converging evidence in seafloor spreading, the process in which our continents are moving about, Good, I was hoping you'd explain that. this essentially pulls these things together in a way that almost makes me suspicious. And a lot of geologists are putting the brakes on lest everyone think that this is a unifying theory with no flaws, for such a theory certainly is not the handiwork of man. Then you mentioned you brought up several questions on Big Bang. I think that was in the news here recently. I know I talked about it on the radio program and the news, the, the news article that I read stated how the universe could have come from particle uh, the size of a, an atom. And you could have won a million dollars. 
That could is a critical operative word. Both of you make a comment on the Big Bang Theory from your... It's purely that, and it's based on this cranking back. If everything's going out, they say, aha, then we'll run it back and see when it all comes together. The question is how fast you run it back. And I agree with you. I don't think anybody has a foggiest idea of doing it. And they come back at different times. And they'll be arguing about that at professional meetings for some time. And we'll all go on with our lives completely indifferent to that, I might add. <laughs> okay. Uh, the the evidence he's referring to about it uh, spreading out, there are a number of astronomers and geologists that would disagree and say it is not spreading out. Uh, the evidence is based on the red shift. Uh, we do not know how far away the stars are. We can only measure up to maybe 100 light years and we're using parallax trigonometry, so some people stretch it to 200. I think that's a little beyond credibility, but uh, regardless, it's certainly not millions. We do not know how far away the stars are. They may very well be billions of light years away, and we do not know for sure that they are spreading. Uh, there are many astronomers, reputable astronomers, who will say that the redshift is due to other causes that has nothing to do with the Doppler effect of light of the receding universe. So uh, I'm not saying they're not spreading, but I'm saying we don't know that they are. If they are, that still does not prove that it started from one point, a Big Bang. It could have started from one creator, and he could have created them in place with some movement or motion, but we don't even know for sure that they are all spreading um, from a common point. Uh, should we respond to other comments or just the Big Bang? Just the Big Bang at this point. We'll okay. Get down to, I'd like to find out about, and I think you all can hear me, can you not? Okay, good. That'll save me moving this mic back and forth. Uh, I like the hand uh, back there that could stand a little more volume. A little more volume? Is that enough? Great. Okay. That's it. I'll let you guys keep that so I don't have to move okay. it back and forth. Uh, you made statement about evolution going on today. It's measurable. It's, uh, I don't know if you use the term irrefutable, that it is going on today. We can give us, give us some illustrations. Give us some examples okay, of evolution going on today. Remember that, that the geologist views evolution as a process in which reality, the universe, and everything on it and in it is evolving. It is not just the organism. So I'm evolving too. I'm getting older. Well, I'm afraid uh, ontogeny is your problem and phylogeny is what we're after, if you want some big words, but the long and short of it is, as an individual, you don't count. <laughs> I know that. Now, in the spiritual world, it's a different story, and you can see why there is more attraction to that than there is to the scientific world. There's not much solace in science. Um, the concept of, of plate tectonics and seafloor spreading is almost mind-boggling in its simplicity and it refuted a lot of things that geologists and geophysicists thought uh, on the same, at the same time it explains a lot of things. Basically what is happening is that our continental plates or the continents are moving some are moving away from one another, such as Africa is moving away from South America and North America. And in the ocean, there is a magnetic, if you will, tape of that movement. Um, you would not be aware of it, and I certainly wouldn't be aware of it if it were not the result of research in my field, that the Earth's magnetic field and compasses point to the north, but 30,000 years ago, the same compass, had it been there, would have pointed to the south. The poles reverse polarity periodically, and a record of it has been established. Um, for those who want to pursue it, you can look up on the Curie point and things of that sort and, and magnetic reversals, but the long and short of it is that as rock cools, You've all seen, and even the, the youngsters have seen, molten rock being spewn out of a, a volcano. As it hardens, it has one temperature when it solidifies. It has another temperature below that in which all the iron particles become fixed, oriented by the Earth's magnetic field at the time they cool. And we were very confused initially because in drilling down through lava flows, of a volcano with the top ones being youngest and the lower ones being older, we found 
that the orientation of the magnetic field according to these lower layers pointed in different directions. And so we said, aha, the Earth's magnetic field is moving. It's just slower than we can record. And the British did the same thing, only they said, well, it's moving different from what you guys are saying. And the people from Russia said, no, it's moving in a different direction. And finally, and this is where you want to talk about examples of being wrong, finally someone came up with the idea that the magnetic pole is not moving, it's the continents. But nobody had the guts to talk about that because geophysicists said we can't move the continents, terra firma until we started drilling in the ocean floor and discovered, indeed, that in these spreading zones we have bands as each crack opens and cools and then is cracked again, you have parallel bands of alternating magnetic fields that match perfectly with the magnetic changes of the volcano layers coming out in the same time frames, all done with radiometric dating to compare one with the other. At the same time, fossil evidence of the first layers on top also added credibility at that point. And then we find that by backing this up, not by chance or by mathematical mode, but by the width of each of these bands and the flow rates that we can measure today. That's where the measurable came. We actually can measure how far apart one plate is moving from another. Uh, with lasers now, we also can measure the earth tide, in which all of us go up and down twice a day, just like the sea goes up and down. But until we had the laser to measure very accurately, we couldn't come up with this. And we now can see such things and project even into the future where continents are going. But this process is going on right now and is changing the face of the earth as it has, and we can reconstruct back I would say with reasonable, and I, what reasonable is, I can't quite spend the time tonight to tell you, but reasonable accuracy for about 500 million years. But when we talk billions of years, no, because the Earth has not had a crust or an atmosphere or a number of things for its entire life. That crust evolved, that atmosphere evolved, and as each came into place, there are some, and we joked about this, who will try to divide that into sevenths and make this the seven days. Uh, this is sort of a wishy-washy thing, a, a characteristic of Can't political years, where people are for the old and for the young, and they're for the rich and for the poor, and anything to get elected. And somehow you have to get this in balance, in a way that you can accept. I could say glibly, you all obey the law of gravity and the first and second laws of thermodynamics much more um, faithfully than you do the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. And I look at the record of Homo sapiens worldwide to substantiate my position. And I'd be willing to bet 10,000 bucks <laughs> that nobody will come up with any evidence to refute this. And so when we say through polls what people believe, you're saying that most of these people believe in God. And I say, fine. But were I to place scientific judgment upon that belief, I would judge them by the properties and the quality of their life. And I don't do that simply because who am I to judge? But I emphasize that this is not a battle between science and the Judeo-Christian heritage. Science applies to the universe. And every, if indeed we find one day that there are other solar systems with people on it, I'm sure that will be embraced under my many mansions, right? So <laughs> the Bible's got it, right. And those people will be living under the same scientific truths that we have established, but not the falsehoods that we as yet do not understand. And that's all I'm saying, is for each of you, we're working, we must recognize we work in two different arenas. The Bible is a text that you accept as being true. And perhaps you have a gentleman like this to interpret it for you, although I favor your interpreting it yourself. 
On the other hand. So do I, by the way. Okay, well, I, you know, I, I don't know, I don't even know your faith, see, so I don't know where you're coming from. Um, you look sort of like a Janus to well, me. I like to have a few okay. people agree with you. I see, I okay. <laughs> right, well, that's, that's always comforting. I like it too, occasionally. Um, on the other hand, science thrives on the idea of throwing the thing out and seeing people say, no, that doesn't apply. And they say, why doesn't it apply? Well, because over here, I did this and that did not apply. That helps me. That's the feedback that is self-corrective to make my proposition next time better. And it may take a century or more before we refine things to where it is predictable. But look around you of all the things that are pretty closely on the money. And so it's something you have to cope with and deal with and bring harmonize, uh, or somehow harmonize it with your religious beliefs. Let me, I don't mean to cut That's you it. off. That's it, I'm off, I'm going, through. But I'd like to have both of you uh, approach it, obviously, we got young and old. There's a conflict there. Young Earth, old Earth. We got some, rec some um, young people and old people too. Yeah, but we we had some uh, different uh, facts dealing with that. I'd like to deal with, as in your estimation, uh, extra biblical proof. In other words, what's the best uh, evidence that creation is a fact, not just a faith? And then, okay, what is your and again. What is your best evidence that evolution is a fact, not a faith? And you may say both are faiths or both are facts, or you may say, um, I'm just throwing out the question. What's your best? I have several questions about evidences for evolution, evidences for creation, and we're talking scientifically now, not from the standpoint of um, Genesis 1. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I would quickly say both are faiths. Uh, neither can so be you, proved. You, you would not... Say that creation is a fact. I believe creation is a fact, but it's not an empirical. I cannot offer any empirical evidence. By that I mean testable, observable, repeatable, demonstrable in the laboratory because I wasn't there. Uh, it cannot be done again, evidently. It's a one-time event that is not testable. It's not, so by the strict definition of empirical, scientific em empirical evidence, it is not, and neither is evolution. They are both uh, hypothesis, theories, uh, whatever word you want to use. Uh, Let me stop you right there. Okay. Yes. No, no, I'm still you. How do you feel about evolution? Do you say I, I feel it's, it is uh, not a fact. Evolution is an explanation that draws together the relationships displayed over and over again in facts. And it is something that we, we, we know more about each decade or year or otherwise. It's self-correcting and will be improved. And to say that, for instance, Darwin was perfectly correct no, he was not perfectly wrong either. And uh, Homo sapiens, of course, doesn't count very much because we've taken ourselves out of natural selection and out of the arena of uh, simply survival of the fittest. On the other hand, I might add that in our, our indifference, if I were going to get on religion, on anything, I would say it has only been in the past decade that I've seen very much towards stewardship, toward this earth. And now in the last week, I've seen a lot more of churches taking on the stewardship of this earth and not to subdue it. It's not a plaything for you to louse up uh, and the, with the environment thing. And it almost uh, mirrors the way industry suddenly said, oh, we've always been interested in the environment. Um, we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that Homo sapiens has lived prodigally, and we have Stern. abused. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sounds like you're talking my language. Hey, I mean, I've uh, I spent a lot of time in a lot of churches. <laughs> let, me, let me say this, and I'll get back, because, and I think I stated on the radio yesterday, I, I believe creation, because the Bible says I'm a very simple-minded preacher, just, but I would like to, I believe both of you have some evidences that uh, would cause one to be believe, and obviously you can't prove you, no, nobody was there. I guess that's what you're both saying. Nobody was there to document. We don't have any eyewitness accounts, but what are the facts that cause you to be outside, extra biblical facts that cause you to believe creation, cause you to believe evolution, besides the age of the earth? Because we've already dealt with that age of the earth. Okay, uh, yes, to, con to finish the, uh, the complexity of life, indicates that the design, and he referred to uh, um, 
fossils are accidents uh, because things are designed to recycle themselves. And uh, I agree, the whole universe is designed, and that indicates a designer. All I have to do is pick up any book and realize that book had an author. To think that a book would come together by an accident, an explosion in a printing press, uh, is absolute folly. And to look at the design in nature and to say that this is a result of a, an accumulation of accidents over billions of years is the height of folly. It had to be designed. That's the best evidence for creation. We have a cre the, the creation itself, the design, is the best evidence for a creator, just like an automobile is the best evidence for a designer. Sure, the automobiles have flaws, but they don't come together from an explosion in a junkyard. They are designed, and it takes intelligent input and effort. I worked at General Motors uh, for two years, and not too intelligent design, but a little bit. Uh, <laughs> what about, um, so would that be, uh, Geologically, any same. The Earth, the Earth also has some incredible processes of recycling and purifying the atmosphere and purifying the water. And the very fact that we have water, water is an incredible, desi incredibly designed commodity, without which life cannot exist. Um, when it freezes, it floats instead of sinks, like every other every every other liquid that freezes. Um, that was designed so that the fish could live during the winter time. Uh, there's so many things that the Earth is the, just the precise distance from the sun and the precise mass to uh, match. The gravitational attraction matches uh, uh, our body, and everything is just precisely designed for human life. And we can only exist in a thin slice even of our own Earth. We cannot live too high in the atmosphere or too deep in the ocean. So there's very, uh, 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 it's very obvious it was uh, designed by a designer. Now, as far as who he was, you know, the religions of the world argue that all the time. I, I happen to know him personally, uh, so <laughs> I don't have a question. I don't have a problem about that. But that's, I think, the best evidence for creation is the design. I, I chuckled, not because I was laughing at you, but I was reminded of my paleontological and biological friends who are in the business of classifying and arguing whether this particular creature is the same species as this or that. And since species by biology has more to do with whether they can produce uh, offspring that are fertile, I always ask them, well, how do you know whether this clam could reproduce with that clam fossil? Um, classifications and design are creations of Homo sapiens. We are the ones who generate classifications. We're very upset when things don't fit our classifications, uh, whether it be simple, such as well, that used to be simple. You could tell a boy and a girl from the one in the dress was a girl, the one with the short hair in the pants was a boy. That those criteria are not valid anymore, and so we have to come up with alternatives. And when it comes to dividing and recognizing species of plants and animals, many times the record is full of examples where a species was named because of the root and another species was named because of the leaf, and when they found that leaf on that tree with that root, that was embarrassing. Uh, but because we try to classify things, the shrinks try to classify you in terms of are you psychotic or are you paranoid, humans are not easily classified and neither is the rest of the, the animal and plant kingdom. What do you see as the... Um, creation? For Whose creation? Judeo-Christian creation? Buddhist creation? There are many beliefs about what creation was. And we don't work for a particular theological context. I can tell you this, and any scientist will tell you, that we haven't the foggiest idea where matter and energy came from. We can just say, through the conservation and first and second laws of thermodynamics, that nothing is created or destroyed. But where it came from initially, we haven't the slightest idea. And anyone who attempts to explain it is either looking for a little PR I or... sign that quote down here. I'm that's all right, yeah, put it on there. Uh, but I don't think any competent individual would do so because we just don't know. And as I said to you, why does gravity attract? Why doesn't it repel? But you see, we are merely describing what is. And if we see order, if we see logic, that depends on our perspective. And if we have a perspective, the first geologists were largely clergymen and, and the noblemen. They're the only ones who were free and had the money to travel and look and didn't have to work. Where, where did this evolutionary 
theory come from? What, what, when we get into evidence, that's what I'm trying to get, what would be the... Well, you have the, the early geologists, and, and Lyell was mentioned. Lyell is, is uh, one, and he was very much set. If you talk about an early person, Lyell came across with the principles of the great age, but he held steadfastly to the idea of creation. Right? And it is alleged, and I don't know this, it was alleged, even though he worked very closely with Darwin, that it was not until Lyell's uh, later years and nearly at death that he admitted that he could see that there was more um, that he believed in with Darwin's view than with the Bible. But he came from a religious background. And uh, he and a number of others went into geology to try and prove the Genesis thing. They actually had this in mind, uh, which is not to say they didn't m contribute, but it is a bias that would go in. And I'm not at all going to say that there aren't geologists or scientists who want to prove that evolution is right. And they will only report the evidence that supports it. And when they run into problems, uh, such as the, the young lady who called after we went off the air and she wanted to know about if all this is working well, how do you explain the anomalous movement of moons in some of the planet, outer planets? We don't explain it. We don't know yet. We do not have a model at present. We probably will. That's the challenge of science, is to continually work at it. And if indeed any of you want to set out to prove some of this wrong, you are going to contribute to a greater understanding of that circle of light. If indeed you keep your personal biases and subjectivity out and work toward simply unraveling a relationship and describing it. I had a question, I had a couple of them, but this one it was very, you know, brought this up, but uh, the, the whole question of dating, several questions came about, you know, the part of the read, the dating of how, how we know that the earth is old or young by dating process, in other words, by actually um, these different dating, carbon-14 you mentioned, mm -hmm. and someone here says, and I don't know if this is a true statement, that the recent published dates of the Grand Canyon gave base uh, basement rocks on the bottom of the Grand Canyon dates almost one billion years younger than the rocks at the top and that they were saying how there is not what is your what causes you to be confident or not confident in the dating mechanisms of today for dating the earth should we I mean you don't take one data point uh, if you remember in in sampling or in math statistical data are worthless unless you have a sufficient cohort of people or a, a number of points. And when you see these scatter plots and conclusions are only drawn if you have enough data points. And if you've got, <laughs> a, a, say, a thousand data points, you're going to find some of these puppies are way off. And if you made your conclusion based on that one, you would be lost. But that's one of the reasons why science thrives on public display of working hypotheses as targets to shoot at. That's how we learn, because like the blind man, the elephant, we only see our one perspective. And we talk about the universe and the earth. We're talking about so many different fields. How do you um, refute the dating, in other words, the okay. fact that they're dating and saying billions of years, that these dating techniques are showing millions and billions of years, how do you, use, and you say an early earth, or um, is that the right terminology? Yes, sir. Call yes, sir. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, Dr. Hiltman stated earlier that uh, he knew the Earth was billions of years old based on radiometric dating. I believe that's an exact quote. Uh, and the, uh, I need to point out to the audience that the great ages for the Earth was established long before any of the radiometric dating methods were invented, before any of the radio carbon dating, potassium argon, uranium lead, before the, anybody even thought of those, they had already agreed the Earth was billions of years old. And who were these people who agreed, by the way? Look up anybody in the 18, 18th century, any of the old textbooks, uh, whether Charles Lyell. Lyell taught the Earth was many thousands of years old. Yes, it did. Based on the geologic column on the order of the strata. On sedimentary records. Sedimentary records. Which are so just about as valid as some of the others. And it has improved. And if you look at the age 
over the, uh, the Earth when it was projected, mm -hmm. and look at the year in which that projection was made, and you put those on a graph, and you'll see the closer you come to 1992, the greater the, n the, the age of the Earth. Oh, and it'll get older, like you said. It'll go to 4.7 sure. billion. And, and it's just like with pi. We're refining the number out further and further. Well, I would disagree there. I don't think it's refining it. I think they keep mm. adding more time because they come across more problems that they can't solve in a limited time. <laughs> Lyle said it was 80,000 years old, and the Earth has now grown to 4.7 billion. So it's getting older at the rate of 65 million years per year. Uh, What's wrong with the, what's, why, why do you not have confidence in their dating mechanism scientifically? Why well, it was, it was, the dating methods are based on the geologic column. If I brought a fossil to any university and said, I would like you to date this for me, their first question would be, where did you find it? Because they want to establish an approximate range based on the geologic column. Then they will break off samples and they will test it for either uranium or potassium or lead or whatever radiometric element they're looking for, uh, which decay method they're using, depending upon the approximate age. Uh, when they went to the moon, they brought back lunar soil. They tested it eight different ways. Science Magazine, 1970, published all the information about that. They obtained eight different ages, all the way from 2 billion to 18 billion. So they decided that none of them were accurate. They threw them all out and picked a number out of the clear blue sky and said the moon was 4.6 billion to match the age of the Earth. Why do you think they threw those dates out? Because it didn't match their prediction, their ex expectation. But it illustrates the point that the radiometric dating is only used to try to further bolster the geologic column dates. The two are trying to work synonymously. Why do you okay. think they threw them out? You had, you sound I like think you just, had a thought there. well, I have a thought of the fact that they were unaccept the scatter was unacceptably scattered. They get that scatter every time they date anything. It means that, no, no, that's not true. Oh, yeah. well, okay. All right, let's go to lead uranium. Okay. Uranium we know quite a bit about because it unfortunately has some characteristics that can be used for good or for evil, and sure. evil tends to really get in there quickly. Uh, well, that's your bag. I'm, I'm not pushing that one. But nonetheless, <laughs> we have today... You, you and let me into that one. That's you know right. I know. I'm a terrible fisherman. <laughs> we have today, and you all are part of a great example of what our society is not doing about this earth. We're happy to use the results are the fruits of radioactivity in the east and the west in a lot of places not Missouri and Kansas so much are dependent on nuclear power sure. we're producing radioactive wastes that are a tremendous threat and doing nothing about it since 1960s when I first it was at KU working on radioactive disposal methods in research over at the Kansas Geological Survey. We were working on it then. Nothing's been done since. But we do know this, that you can't take radioactive material, uranium or thorium or even some of the artificial ones, and change it. You can't speed it up or slow it down. You can freeze it. You can zap it with a laser. You can swear at it. You can do whatever you wish, and it continues in its way of decaying in a predictable way. And the radioactive dating with uranium and lead is effectively based on the half-life of the uranium and how much lead we have and how much uranium we had and making the assumption, which is accepted by anyone who has worked with this as valid, is that if we start with the uranium and see how many how much of it is now daughter lead, we know how much time it took for those uranium atoms to convert to lead. And that basis irrefutably gives consistent data, and that technology, as opposed to some of the others, is quite good. That does not mean that someone can misread it, just as much as I have had people stick a thermometer in my mouth and tell me that I had a fever and I read it, and it says it 98.7. And I said, well, I must have read it wrong. Well, that human error is present everywhere. But the procedure, when done under controlled conditions and by a number of labs, consistently converge on about a 4.5.6 for the Earth, not for the universe. The universe is, say, about four times older. And, um, Yes, you can, you can come up with, with data that are wrong and they're thrown out because they're garbage.
Okay, uh, the best illustration of the now, dating methods, uranium, lead, potassium, argon, uh, whichever one they want to use, would be the illustration, if you walked into a room and a candle was burning on the table, and I asked you the question, when was it lit? Well, you could measure the rate of burn and find out that the candle is currently burning one inch per hour, and if the candle is six inches tall and it's burning at an inch an hour, and I ask you the question, when was it lit? You could, you could tell me when it will go out. It'll go out in six hours. But you can only tell me when it was lit if you, gave, if you were allowed two assumptions. Number one, you would have to assume an initial height. How tall was it? We don't know. Number two, you would have to assume that that rate of burn has remained constant for the entire time it's been burning. Based on those two assumptions, you could give a reasonable answer. But if either assumption is wrong, your answer is wrong. So all of the dating methods are based on seven assumptions all of which I hold to be faulty. I have them all listed on my chart over here. You're welcome to come look at it afterwards. They are assuming that all of the lead in the sample is daughter lead, as he uh, illustrated. We don't know that. It may have been created half lead, half uranium. Uh, so the lava coming from volcanoes is frequently dated. Matter of fact, Leakey's uh, uh, skulls were dated, not his personal skulls, the ones that he found. Uh, <laughs> Leakey's uh, discoveries were dated using the lava that they were in, the lava in the same strata, using potassium argon. And yet I can give you many references. Uh, I don't have, don't have them with me. I have them over at the church. But uh, references of where potassium argon, uranium lead uh, dating methods have proven to be wildly wrong because the initial assumptions uh, determine your outcome. It could easily have been created recently with a certain quantity of uranium or lead. The very fact that we have radiopolonium halos, uh, which would be pretty technical for this audience, but uh, the very fact that they exist in granite rock indicates that the Earth was created cold, not hot. It did not cool down, and I have plenty of information on that. Uh, as far as, uh, well, I've got a hundred other things we've kind of glossed over here, but uh, you, you said that the, it irrefutably shows the Earth to be 4.6 billion years old. Well, that's irrefutably assuming, or based on the assumptions that you accept. You are accepting the thought that um, there was no lead or uranium present uh, in a mixture to begin with, and that all of the lead is daughter lead, and that the sample has remained pure. I would contend, and I think could easily show, uh, as a matter of fact, I may have that book with me, where of the 19,000 uh, dating methods uh, done in a survey, they did a survey of 19,000 dating methods, only, I, th I believe only 1,000 was considered acceptable because the others fell outside of the uh, expected date based on the geologic column. And therefore, the information was not published. So the only dates that get published are the ones that are politically correct uh, based on the current evolutionary theory. If something goes wrong, if a laboratory comes up with a wildly different age, it will not make it into the accepted publications because that might cause the common people to realize that they're not as unified in their belief as they would like them to think. If the stars are billions of light years away, and we do not know that they are, but uh, let's assume that they are, and they may very well be. We only know up to 60 or 100 light years based on parallax trigonometry. Uh, so the first thing you have to realize is we do not know the distance to the stars. Uh, there may be some that are billions of light years away, and there probably are. But uh, I would say from a creationist standpoint that if the God that I worship is able to create the stars, he could certainly create the star light already in place. Uh, he made them to be a light on the earth, the book of Genesis tells us, so he made the stars and the light at the same time. Third thing we need to realize is that we do not know that the speed of light is a constant. It may have gone faster in the past. Light may have been infinitely fast in the past. We do not know that it's a constant. I can easily prove that it's not a constant. They talk about the Doppler effect of light, uh, the red shift. Well, that proves light is not constant. If you're in a car driving down the highway going 60 miles an hour and you flip your headlights on, is the light from your headlights going the speed of light plus 60? Uh, the speed of light is not necessarily a constant, 186,000 miles per second, and it could very well have been that the speed of light has been decaying. We would not notice it much now if we're on the tail end of the logarithmic curve uh, because it begins to taper out toward near flat. We also would not notice it because most of our measuring instruments to, uh, when I was in physics class in high school, we measured the speed of light in the hallway with rotating mirrors and a laser, which is not a real accurate way to do it, but we got close. And the, the more accurate ways involve atomic clocks. And if uh, to, for your time factor, and if the speed of light is decaying, it may be also at the same time throwing off our atomic clocks at the same rate. Therefore, you would not notice uh, a decline. There's been some very uh, reputable, reasonable research on the, that very question, is the speed of light a constant? 
And so far, it's still up for grabs, but uh, there are a number of people who say, no, light is not constant. Well, to go to the question to um, on the other side, if evolution is true, and several pointed this up, why are there not hundreds of skeletons of various stages of man rather than just a few partial skeletons? Well, just as I say, preservation of an organism is an accident. It shouldn't happen. The only time that a fossil is formed, be it human or otherwise, is when the remains are preserved by a catastrophic entrapment, usually in the absence of oxygen. Uh, man is uh, superior in his abilities to, um, that he also inhabits the atmospheric, um, well, let's simply say, the terrestrial environment, breathing air, and not swimming around in the bottom of the swamp where he might be preserved along with the log. We do find remains. We also have, as a result of theological views, the idea that has persisted for a long time relative to an afterlife. And we have done things with those bodies. Uh, in some cases, we have cremated them. That eliminates the fossil part rather nicely. Most burial types particularly in the, in the early, we'll say the Old Testament, the, the Jewish religion, you bury them quickly without preservation. That encourages no fossils. Now, I cannot say what's going to be here when we have all these glass in case the preserve the body bit, the sort of uh, the, the renaissance of the Egyptians bit where you kill the slaves and put food in there and music and the whole schmear in the hope that they'll have all that stuff. There's, even there, they ended up getting looted. But fundamentally, that should happen with other organisms. We have teeming hordes of creatures, mostly arthropods, that have one purpose, and that is destroying the decaying remains of the dead. Another question that kind of comes up here, and um, we have the skeleton remains of, seems like, a lot of dinosaurs that were here millions of years ago that have, but we don't have the skeletons of the man that were here millions of years That's ago. That's largely because man, man, man and the dinosaurs. How long I don't, I don't want to trash your idea about the Flintstones and Alley Up, but man and the dinosaurs were not there at the same time. As a matter of fact, mammals were small creatures, and with the demise of the dinosaurs, that opened an ecological niche where they came in. And I know my colleague insists we have dinosaurs today, and that man, and well, that the Aliop um, syndrome lives. Well, I'd like to get into that one. I'm going to get into that <laughs> dinosaurs today. I don't want to wipe out anybody who's eating Flintstone vitamins. They're good That's for it. you. Take them. Um, dinosaurs, um, uh, boy, there was some question about dinosaurs, so I'm trying to think how and, uh, but how long ago dinosaurs, and I'd like for both of you to address how long do you believe, I mean, or do you have an idea how long you think man has been on the earth? I mean, we talk about beginnings, we talk about the beginning sure. of earth, but man, but dinosaurs, um, maybe some okay. comment about dinosaurs and just a general comment. All right, I would say without question, all life, uh, all species of life have been here the same length of time, six or 7,000 years. Man, uh, all animals created at the same time. About 95% of the animals that have lived are now extinct. We have seen a tremendous amount of extinction, and yet no new kinds of animals have ever come on the scene. We have new varieties, but that's just variation. That is not evolution. The only examples uh, evolutionists will point to uh, as evidence for evolution is, is examples of variation taking two dogs and developing a variety of dogs. But, and you can do that, there's no question, a variety of cows or corn, but uh, you can crossbreed dogs for the next 20 million years and you will always get dogs. You will never get elephants or tomatoes or bananas. You will always get the same kind of animal. I didn't say that only. I think well, generally. One of the ways sure, okay. in which we preserve large masses, right. yes. There are trillions of fossils available to study and yet no intermediate fossils from one kind to another. So it's not that uh, to me, that's a perfect proof of a great catastrophe, the worldwide flood. The top 3,000 feet of Mount Everest from 26,000 to 29,000 is all sedimentary rock containing millions of seashells and uh, water-dwelling creatures. So the Earth definitely There's was... another hour. Worldwide flood. Uh, no be... question. The worldwide flood explains the fossils, why there are so many What's of them. What's a cubit? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, heard, he's heard Bill Cosby too, hasn't he? I know that one. Uh, yeah, right. Bill Cosby straightened that one sure. out. So, uh, 
the creationist explanation of fossils is very simple. I agree they have to be preserved in the absence of oxygen, and a worldwide flood burying them in uh, hundreds or thousands of feet of sediment would quickly cause the formation of fossils. Wood can petrify in good conditions in 30 to 50 years. There have been petrified pallets dug up in Tennessee, a church I just preached at. Uh, they had an old pallet shop where they had accidentally covered some 30 or 40 years ago, and when they just uncovered them here recently, they had petrified, turned to solid rock. Iowa farmers pulled up some fence posts that had been in the ground 50 years, and they had petrified from ground level down in 50 years. So the worldwide flood would have caused all the fossils. And it, it's not that there aren't enough fossils to study. There are trillions of fossils, but there aren't any intermediate fossils to study because they bring forth after their kind, exactly like the Bible says. There, there has been no evolution in the sense of changing from one kind of animal to another. Dinosaurs have always lived with man. Man is responsible for killing them off. Where all this, that's where all the legends of the killing of the dragons come from. And a few species, like Apatosaurus, 30 foot long, are still in Africa right now. I've got a green book on the table. Dr. Roy Mackle, an avid evolutionist, has been over there twice. There have been 12 expeditions uh, to the central Congo swamp in the last 12 years to try to photograph the Apatosauruses still living there. And that's where my research has been in cryptozoology. I have many pictures and uh, eyewitness accounts of some of these few remaining dinosaurs that are still alive. And they're not like Komodo dragons. Uh, they, if, of course, if we had not found the Komodo dragon alive and had only found the skeleton, it would be listed as a dinosaur. The fact that it's alive precludes it from being a dinosaur in the minds of many. But uh, their dinosaurs have been hunted to the point of extinction in most parts of the world, and most species are extinct. But a few still remain to this day. That would be a fun trip for... Uh, He's going back this year. Dr. Mackle is. Right. Contro controversial about dinosaurs. We have, again, two things there I saw come up that we just, I'm sorry, the, f the flood, worldwide flood, and uh, evidences for that we haven't even got into. Uh, dinosaurs, but uh, and all about di are they today? Are they not today? What were they? Where? When were they? Um, which I don't know how strong that is for or against position of evolution or creation. I think a, a common concern, and I, you you approached this yesterday on the radio, but I'd like to maybe conclude with, and I think this is really um, deals with the whole subject as far as uh, I'm concerned. And both of you stated that you're dealing with a, a faith rather than a fact. And uh, why is it that only evolution is taught, in your estimation, in our school system? And maybe it's not that way, but it seems to be. Um, and I think you, you stated, you think, um, if I can get the right words, uh, was it you stated they're, they're hiding it. Um, it's kind of being kept out on Cre purpose. Creation is being kept out? Politically expedient to teach evolution. It's the currently accepted theory. Just like the flat earth, you know, when, it's, when that, everybody believed flat earth, you didn't dare teach anything else, well, or are, geocentric theory. We're or dealing anything. with theories, so theory, uh, what's your theory, why it's not being, why uh, evolution is being taught as fact rather than theory? Well, because the implications Which of... I can, I can document that. Sure. Oh, I just, I've got yeah. many hundreds of the public school textbooks myself. I collect them. But um, the, the implications of creation are unacceptable to many. If this world was created, then there may be a creator that they have to be accountable to. And I'm convinced that's a strong underlying reason. The second thing, I think, is majority opinion. People are afraid to go against their colleagues' opinion, and they know they will be censored out or ridiculed. Uh, you don't dare go against the established scientific uh, dogma. Just like Galileo was nearly executed for saying the moon had craters on it because the scientific establishment said, no, the moon was smooth. And anytime you go against the, the politically correct um, attitude of the day, you are asking to be you're ostracized. You're using the term political, if I can interrupt you. You're talking about well, politically that, not from... Not from Democrat and Republican, no, no. You're talking about in the scientific community. Right, in the scientific peer community. Pressure peer pressure. Peer pressure. It is... It is, it is scientifically acceptable to believe in evolution, and it is scientifically unacceptable. Uh, of course, then you've got to have to get a definition of who is a scientist. In the many, they will say, if you do not believe in evolution, you are not a scientist. Therefore, you are not qualified to make a judgment. Uh, I, say, I asked the uh, uh, doctor yesterday on the radio, or Monday, Sunday on the radio, if what would happen if a geologist at this university began believing in a young earth and creation? And he said he does not think such a creature exists. In other words, if you believe in creation, and I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but if you believe in creation and the, if you believe the earth is young, you are no longer a qualified geologist. 
What the, just kind of expand on yesterday. You're talking about why. Yeah, let me let me address uh, the initial part there, though, about why <coughs> evolution is taught and creation isn't. Remember, I pointed out early that science is not grinding an axe for any particular thing. It's just working at this basis on and completely separate of any particular source. Now, the creationist view as put forth by creation science in this country stems entirely from Judeo-Christian literature, which in this country where we have a separation of church and state, you can impose one particular sex view on the society, whereas there is no particular aspect of theology in the reporting of the converging evidence toward this is how the earth was formed and the evidence Question. before it. Is now, the argument, or, let, me, let me get the first numbers that you paused to write down. Read those back that he made mention of 94% of the people believe in such and such and do not believe. Now, suddenly this less than 10% of, of people who constitute this powerful lobby, we scientists who few people know, have imposed our biased view and thrown out facts. I think that what we're dealing with here is, the, I say, judge for yourself. Remember, as I say, think of what scientific investigation and the reality, the truth that it has brought, have generated in your life today. But suddenly we pick on one particular subject? No, that's not true at all. It is basically a question of, um, it's not a finished theory. We and don't was, know all. And I was fishing, as you, as you said. Well, it could be, but I the long and short. I was fishing for you to yeah. say what you said yesterday, because yeah. I believe, and you were talking about political, mm -hmm. you're, but you were talking about the political scientific community, but you were talking about yesterday, political, and that's I think these, we the people, I think that's why you're here, you have allowed it to happen. I mean, you're the ones yeah. that have allowed, because he was saying politically, yeah. every textbook is determined by the local community. And if you're allowing it to happen, you're saying we're gonna, yeah. if, you, if you believe that it ought to be taught, uh, it ought not to be taught as fact, well then you ought to be telling somebody about that <coughs> versus uh, sitting around and complaining about it. And uh, that's what a lot of people do. If they don't like something, they complain mm -hmm. about it instead of saying something about it and telling somebody you don't like it and saying, you know, change it. And but uh, you're going to have to come up with reasons other than it is not my belief. Right. Because your religious belief is not a basis of imposing a means of instruction. And, I think and you cannot believe me in a courtroom or in a valid debate get by with some of the misrepresentations that have come from creation science, where they selectively take certain things and use them. And I'm not saying scientists don't do it, but on the side of science is the overwhelming strength of self-criticism, self, -criticism, self uh, we might say, refinement and development of growth in a, an environment of criticism. But Dr. Hiltman has been, and Dr. Hoven both have stated, and uh, we, we have it uh, an, uh, an understanding that both are, in scientific terms, theories. In scientific terms, theories. Um, a theory because nobody was there. Mm -hmm. And that's my only contention, of course, as a Bible-believing Christian, and uh, from biblical perspective, I've stated again, I'm all open to the theory. My biggest contention is okay. the fact that, that textbooks yeah. say it's fact. Well, let's put, it, let's put it in the context of today's news or the last week. We've been, I've been listening, and I'm so sick and tired of hearing about this couple in Topeka with their baby in and out of the hospital because of their beliefs that without medicine and so forth. When you get into the field of medicine and much of what we're doing there, it's based on a number of things that are not accepted by religious dogma. And if you don't choose to accept it, you don't have to. But the long and short of it, as I say, you have a community in this society here in Kansas City, in this room, and in the United States, with a Judeo-Christian background, that fundamentally are living much of their lives accepting on faith the fruits of scientific research. 
where it comes a cropper with the idea of a long or short age of the earth, that's a problem. And if I were going to accuse anybody of choosing the facts that give them the right date, I would say it is a creation scientist who cannot accept a long time unless they have to compromise the idea that the seven days were longer than seven days or some other you know, uh, circumvention of the, the element. They don't want to compromise their faith. And I'm not saying they should. I'm just simply saying is don't accuse us of attacking the Bible. When I look at a rock or I interpret a fossil, I do so merely to unravel a bit of Earth's history to broaden that circle of light. Where the knowledge falls, I don't know. Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, he was motivated to do good for mankind. But obviously, it, his knowledge was misused. And probably it brought more harm than good. I don't know. But we're not responsible for that. Right, I agree. With no, that. you are. And that's exactly, exactly it. And yeah, you're exactly. the ones who have to come you're to grips the, with the problem of the certain realities and certain faith. And that's it. Don't let anybody talk you out of anything, but don't expect schools to accept the argument that this is my belief. You can go to a religious school and do that, but if it's going to be a public one, it almost has to be independent of any theological view. I agree, and that's where evolution falls in the realm of theology, and it does not Well, that's a the point that's been tested in the courts and will be tested again, and I'm not going to say that when the court Maybe says this is right, because well, I disagree with the court more often sure. than not. So well, many I'm sure the group, will probably, we can all agree well, on that. I think that if we come to the conclusion that neither of these gentlemen are the ones that get to say ultimately what's printed in the textbooks, which is, um, you know, but you are supposed to be able to. Uh, and th that's kind of correct. where we, we uh, I love to carry it on all night, and some of you probably would stay here all night. And I appreciate it. Some of you are in, would say, uh, I've heard yeah. enough. I mean, if you want to stay around and ask some questions of these gentlemen, please don't. Uh, again, I think it's been an excellent evening. I'd like to thank them. I'd like for you to thank them for their good spirits. And it's been... Uh, and what I uh, had hoped, uh, uh, just a good discussion of, of these uh, the facts and what, well, as we perceive them. So let's thank these gentlemen for uh, being here. Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hoven's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ, as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer.
Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals like the longevity chart, which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils, and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. DrDino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. DinosaurAdventureLand.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hovind and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hovind has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics, such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new exciting Dinosaur Adventureland. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park, where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson and captivate everyone from age 4 to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church, or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503, or call us at 850-479-3466, or toll-free in the U.S., 877-479-3466.